Will you stand then for prayer and for the reading of God's word in Matthew 25? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for what we've heard and gathered and been taught already in the devotional, in Sunday school class, in our singing here together. And I pray that as Glenn comes to proclaim God's word, especially in that area of the gospel and wealth, Heavenly Father, that you would bless him with your spirit, his unction. As we hear and listen, I pray that our hearts can be stirred and maybe even convicted of right living with you in this area of, of um, money, Heavenly Father. I pray for Jonathan Stolzfus for healing for him, for the peace of God for him and his family in this time. We commit him especially to you. Um, I think of the ladies' sewing circles this week and for the wonderful ministry that that is in our midst and pray that as they do that, that it could be a blessing to the recipients, many on the other side of the world, far, far away. I think too of the Christian Aid meat canning and that little short-term local ministry that we can be involved in and pray that um, the fellowship of those volunteers could be pleasing in your sight on Tuesday as well. Thank you that you are God. Thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as a baby in a virgin birth and that his sacrifice on the cross forgives us of our sins yet today. We are so blessed by that and want to serve you with all of our heart and soul and life until he comes again. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strewed. And I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His servant answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strewed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you may be seated. Good morning. 
Amazingly enough, I do have my notes with me, even if we can't get the PowerPoint to work. When I was assigned this topic of uh, the gospel and wealth, um, looking into the values of kingdom living, I thought it'd be pretty easy because I work at Anabaptist Financial and I um, see a lot of people's finances and I've participated in uh, seminars talking about budgeting and saving and debt and how that should all work and look. And I work around a lot of really smart people when it comes to finances. So I thought that I could do this with a fairly minimal amount of effort and, um, and come up with a sermon pretty quickly. And I did that. And then on Tuesday, um, I took a different direction. So if, um, if there's anyone here that finds this sermon uninspiring and boring and um, you're very disappointed, just know that there's a whole other sermon that's really good and uh, that you should probably hear. But alas, you're stuck with this one. You've all heard phrases like, um, you can fall off of both sides of the horse and there's a ditch on both sides of the road. And sometimes we view finances like that. Um, and maybe that's uh, the case, whether we're focusing too much on finances or uh, pretending like we don't uh, worry about them at all and get into financial trouble. But I think um, wealth and the desire to be wealthy actually pulls us in the opposite direction of Christ. We're giving some, given some fairly strong warnings in Scripture relating to that. So maybe it's not just either side of the road. Maybe it's actually opposite directions on that road. Now, I don't want to um, stand up here and just uh, sling ideas and mud at you in hopes that because you live in North America and you're wealthy, that you'll feel guilty um, about that. That's not my intention and it's very difficult to, to preach on this subject because of uh, where we live and the affluence that we have uh, affects how we view scriptures on wealth. And so it's kind of difficult to get um, an unbiased uh, view on that. So my goal is to uh, individually and collectively here together uh, take a look at our vision. Where is our treasure where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Vision in our lives is extremely important. If we don't have a vision for where we're going, um, we are doomed. So is my vision focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and his return, or is it on earthly things? Maybe you're here today and you just need a little bit uh, clearer vision. Maybe your glasses have fogged up and you just need to, to have clearer vision. Or maybe um, we need to correct our vision and alter our course. Or maybe we need to completely change the direction of where our focus lies. We had neighbors um, who, uh, beginning early in the summer, would um, get out their mowers to mow the yard. They have about an acre property and there was three or four boys there. And they would use um, the real mowers, the Amish mowers, to mow their yard. And I was amazed um, at how hard they needed to push to make those uh, mowers cut grass. But I was even more amazed when they started running behind these mowers to mow the yard. And not only that, but sometimes they would strap on 60-pound packs while they mowed the yard in 90-degree heat. Now, I figured out why they did that. They had a vision. And their vision was that in September, in late September, they wanted to be in Colorado hunting elk. And they needed to be able to climb uh, the highest peaks to get to where the biggest elk were. And they wanted to be in shape for that. So their vision led to action and preparation. Our vision certainly affects our lives. Hebrews 12, verse 2, Wherefore, seeing we are also, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race 
that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Did you catch it? How did Jesus endure the cross? Because he focused on the joy, the future joy that was before him, and that helped him endure the agony of the cross. Even Jesus needed vision to accomplish the goal. Part of the training for professional race car drivers is uh, preparation in the event of an accident because when you're traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour, um, things can go downhill pretty rapidly if somebody loses control. And so when there is an accident, they are trained to focus. Uh, there's cars sliding all around the tracks and debris, and they're trained to focus on any open gap they can find. And they look into that gap and through that gap, and that helps them maneuver their cars around the debris. If they focus on a car next to them, they're more likely to hit that car than if they focus on the open gaps. There's a direct connection between their focus and their brain and their hands on the wheel. In our lives, there's a direct connection between our focus, and our hearts, and our handling of wealth. So the goal of this sermon is to take my vision off of all the debris around us and focus clearly and consistently on Jesus Christ. Now try to go along with me through this sermon without being too critical of people around you. One of the things that makes it difficult to talk about money is because we compare ourselves among ourselves. And some of you are already thinking of people here who need to hear this message because everything they touch turns to gold and they're obviously too materialistic and they need to get their act together. Well, maybe they've just been given ten talents and they're trying to be faithful with what the Lord has given them. Others of you are here and you're um, thinking about people who um, can't quite make it in finances and maybe they're even so broke that it's hard for them to pay attention. Maybe they've been given one talent, and they're being faithful with the talent they've been given. All of us, whether we have ten talents or one talent, need to be faithful with the master's resources. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And you can figure out where your treasure is by listening to yourself talk or watching what you do in your free time what you are excited about, what you talk about, where you spend your time is likely where your treasure is. So the Bible teaches that wealth is dangerous. And yet we're told to use it. We live in this materialistic world, in the material world, the physical world. But we're told not to be a product of that world. Now, I want to just uh, give, us, give ourselves a little bit of a challenge here. Um, but be careful not to take this too far. Um, scripture talks about uh, the women's head covering, and we take that literally. We practice it. It talks about non-resistance, and we practice it. We accept it, and we practice it. Well, how are we doing with Luke 6.35? Or what about Matthew 6.19? Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Do we practice this? Jesus taught that wealth is dangerous. And we look around us and we think about somebody who has maybe worked all their lives and they don't have much to show for it. They haven't accumulated much material wealth and we say that they are a, a poor steward. How did we get from wealth is dangerous to somebody who doesn't have a lot of material possessions is a poor steward? Or how do we get from life consisteth not in what we possess to being willing to take on lots of debt in order to obtain possessions? Have we forgotten that we are not actually the owners? We're the stewards of the manager's wealth, of the owner's wealth. I want to remind us that stewardship is not a choice. Um, you can try to convince yourself that you own things here on this earth. But Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12, clearly tell us that God owns everything. And Genesis reminds us that he created all things. 
and by him all things consist. So in this life, the only thing we can own is the use of an item. And each day we're only one heartbeat away from losing everything that we've so desperately worked for. Now turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 16. And I'm going to read uh, nine verses. I think for the sake of time here, I'm going to paraphrase uh, this story, and you can follow along as, as I'm doing that. Um, there's a king in Judah named Asa, and he wanted to protect himself against Israel. And so he relied on his allegiance with a, an ungodly king to fulfill that, rather than relying on God. And I'm going to jump in at verse 7. And by the way, he was successful in accomplishing his goal. He protected the nation of Judah. In verse 7 it says, At that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Assyria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore in the host is the host of the king of Assyria escaped, escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lebums a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The Lord is looking for those of us who are willing to trust him and not rely on our own riches. Has your trust, has my trust in God been compromised? And have we replaced that trust in God with uncertain riches? So God owns it all. The question then becomes, am I a steward, a faithful steward, or am I a thief of what God has placed into my care? Have I been using God's resources for his benefit or for my own? And my sermon today revolves around uh, several aspects of stewardship that we see in Matthew 25, the passage that was read. We see there's a master and there's a steward who serves the master. There is ownership. The steward does not own the goods, but the master gives, him, gives them to him to use while he is uh, absent. There's trust that the master has in the steward to disperse his goods to him. And there's expectations that the steward needs to meet. And then the master is absent. He goes on a journey. And there's the return of the master, and there are consequences. And I'd just like to quickly remind us one more time that we are not the owners. God owns all. 1 Corinthians 6.19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are not to be our own masters. We are to serve God. Am I living like a steward? Or have, have I somehow convinced myself that I'm able to be the owner? In Luke chapter 12, and you can turn there if you'd like, there's an account of a man who built bigger barns and hoarded his wealth. And we would uh, probably look at somebody today next to us, maybe our neighbors, if they built bigger barns, we would say, wow, they're doing well, they're good stewards. Um, and I think this man's neighbors probably said the same thing. But if you notice in that chapter how many times he refers to himself, how many times the word I is used, I have gained this. I will build bigger barns. And then I will take uh, my rest. But God said that he was a fool. Now we want to, this morning, take personal inventory of our attitude and vision to see if we're faithful servants of the Master or if we would be called a fool when God looks at how we've handled his wealth. There are five attitudes that I would like to look at this morning that should be displayed in the life of a faithful steward. And each of these attitudes have a counterpart 
that the devil would like to use uh, to destroy what God has um, blessed us with. The first one I'd like to look at, the first attitude of a faithful servant is contentment. And you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Now, here is my paraphrase of this, these verses. Servants are to honor their masters and treat them with respect. If anyone teaches otherwise, he disagrees with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is proud. He knows nothing, and he is so far from the truth that he supposes that gain is godliness. Do not hang around with this man. This man thinks that gain equals godliness, wealth equals wisdom, and riches equal reward. The correct formula is godliness with contentment is great gain. We came into this world with zero belongings, and we will take exactly zero assets with us when we leave this world. So if we are rich enough to have food and clothing, we should be content. If we are discontent, and our goal is to be rich, we will tend to fall into temptation and traps, and we follow foolish and painful cravings, which drown us in destruction and eternal damnation. The love of money is the root from which all other evil grows. Some being filled with this covetousness have left the faith and are filled with piercing pain and sorrow. But men of God are to run away from these temptations, these traps, and these foolish cravings, and run toward righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Now, we could probably end the sermon there. I don't think there's any clearer teaching in Scripture about what wealth is than this portion of Scripture. Now, in our relationship with God, there is a certain amount of discontentment that we need to have, and I think that God places within us. We want, uh, I think God wants a deeper level of relationship with us each day, and we uh, aren't to be so content that we want to live on this earth forever. And so there's something in every one of us that wants something more. We're reaching out to something more, something higher. And we should be reaching towards God. But again, we, we, we tend to follow the carnal path of this discontentment. I think discontentment and covetousness is the cause of almost all of our debt. Think about the debt you have and why you have it. Were you contented with what you have and so you went out and needed to, to assume debt? I think we become discontented and covetousness and therefore we allow ourselves to be burdened with, with debt. I went to Romania um, 20 years ago or so, and I had a car that worked fine. It was um, not the nicest car in the youth group or anything like that, but it worked well. And I went to Romania, and I saw the poverty of these people, and um, I sort of decided that uh, I wouldn't need a new car for a very long time. I could just uh, do just fine with what I had. 
about two months after I came home, I found myself with a new car. Some of my friends were buying cars, and I became a little discontent with mine and maybe coveted theirs, and so I even went into debt to purchase this car. That's what uh, discontentment and covetousness can do to our minds. It's unfortunate that in America, consumption drives our economy, and this has made an impact on, on your life, on my life, without even us recognizing it. Um, even after the attacks of 9-11, do you remember what George Bush, who was then president, told us to do? We were to go shopping, to kickstart the economy, continue to spend our money, to keep the economy going because the economy is driven by consumption. I found a statistic, and statistics are a little dangerous. You can find almost anything you want, but this one says that 1% of what we purchase is still used after six months. 99% of what we buy is either already in the trash or is no longer in use after six months. Wealth in America is measured by the stuff that we accumulate. Wealth in God's kingdom is measured by godliness and contentment. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And sometimes it feels like I'm running in a circle or I'm spinning my wheels. And maybe it's because half the time I'm running towards wealth and the other half of the time I'm running towards God. The second attitude of a faithful steward is gratefulness. And we heard about this already this morning. And so I can save some, some of your time here and um, move rather quickly. But Zacchaeus illustrated gratefulness when the Lord met him. And he was grateful to host the Lord. And his joyful gratitude even affected his finances. He gave away some of his belongings he was, a grateful, he was grateful to be a steward. He no longer needed to be an owner of the things that he had. As servants, we have no right to grumble about the talent that we have, whether we have ten or one. We've been given it, it's been given to us by the master, and we're asked to be faithful with the resources that he gives us. And I think often um, people who have been given one talent are rather critical of people who the master has chosen to give ten talents. It's a large responsibility to receive those resources and be faithful with them. And I think we need to pray for those among us who have been given ten talents, that they handle them well. There's plenty of room in God's kingdom for wealth. We can use, uh, the kingdom can use their resources to bless others. And that's how we end up with places like Christian Aid or Bald Eagle Boys Camp. That's how we can run our schools and our churches, by the generosity of these individuals who have been given much. So we should bless and encourage them uh, rather than thinking less of them or making comments that causes them to hide back in their shell and be less accountable rather than more accountable. We tend to think that a missionary is on a much better spiritual level than the businessman that supports him. Both of these men have a vision for the lost, and they're working together to accomplish the Great Commission. God calls some to serve on the mission field, and he calls some to manage wealth to the honor and glory of God. The third attitude we want to look at is expectancy, anticipation of the return of the master. And this is something that is almost difficult for me to talk about because uh, this is, my, I think, one of my weakest areas. But the attitude of expectancy will change the way we live our lives. Matthew 25, 
the beginning of the chapter is uh, the portion of Scripture that talks about the ten virgins which took, took their lamps and they were waiting. And some of them were anticipating, they were all anticipating the bridegroom. And in verse 5 it says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The wise virgins were waiting and anticipating the return of the bridegroom. And their watchful attitude produced a pattern in their lives. The foolish virgins um, were not anticipating, were not prepared for the return. In our lives, um, we need to live with that anticipation of the return of the Master. It's been 2,000 years since our master has taken his leave, but he is coming again. He will return. I think those of you who hunt would understand the level of anticipation and how anticipation can be lost over the course of time. In the morning for the first hour, every twig that snaps uh, creates a flutter in your heart or maybe you skip a heartbeat. But by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, a deer can sneak right up on you um, without, even, without you even knowing it's there. Because you lost that level of anticipation and you're no longer looking around with every noise. Anticipation is such an important part of our Christian lives. Do you believe that Jesus Christ can return tomorrow? And like I said, this is difficult for me because he didn't come back yesterday or the day before that. As a matter of fact, my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were all anticipating the return of the Lord. The disciples who saw him leave were anticipating his return. There's been 14,000 days in my life that Jesus has not returned. And that sheer amount of time takes effect, has its effect on my level of anticipation. There's been 730,000 days since he left, approximately. And that sheer amount of time affects us. We struggle with anticipating the return of the Lord, to live in that expectant hopefulness of his imminent return. And it's evident by the way that we manage our wealth. But we are commanded to watch. Imagine what your life would look like if every day you anticipated the return of the king. So we start to think that we'll always be here. This is our home, and we forget that we're just passing through, and so we start to accumulate, and we excessively purchase things that we don't need, and we begin to hoard. We become excessive and wasteful. Often, Later in life, in, in the early parts of our lives, when we're raising a family, it seems like our income is just enough to meet the expenses. But later in life, we start to accumulate, and the income is higher than our expenses. And if you want to know what's in a person's heart, follow them through their life. You can listen to what they say, but watch where the money goes when they have extra. We can learn so much from observing that, much more than... Uh, any of the sermons that we've heard them preach earlier in life. And a lot of times, that spending is just a direct result of where their vision was when they couldn't afford all the extra things. And so earlier in life, if I um, wanted to buy a new truck, but I couldn't afford it, later in life, I have a new truck because I can't afford it. If earlier in life, I wanted to give to missions, but I couldn't afford it, later in life, I find myself giving to missions because I now have extra cash. It's just a result of where the vision was. And a lot of those visions and habits are, 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 um, are born early in our lives. And they don't, um, 
manifest themselves until uh, older age. The fourth attitude I want to look at here of a faithful steward is humility. And you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. It's the story of the servant who owed his king 10,000 talents, and he couldn't pay, and his Lord forgave him. Actually, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment to be made. And this man begged for his life. He fell down and worshipped his master, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And his Lord forgave him. He was moved with compassion, and he forgave him. He loosed him and forgave him the debt. The same servant went out and found somebody that owed him a hundred pence. And he had him, he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and forced him to pay every dime. These actions were reported to the master, and he called his servant in, and he said, Thou wicked and thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest now thou shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? I think humility uh, is important as a steward, recognizing that all we have comes from God. And all we have been forgiven for is a direct result of God's grace. And we need to um, mirror that forgiveness uh, to the lives of those around us. Now this parable came just after the disciples were discussing who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus said that whoever wants to be greatest should humble himself and be as a child. And that person would be the greatest. Now, pride wants to lift itself up, to lift myself up, but humility understands that we serve a master. David was humble. When, even when Saul was chasing him through the wilderness, twice he had opportunity to, to kill Saul. But in humility, he understood that it was not his kingdom. He was a steward of what God had given him. He responded in humility, and, and that was passed on to Saul. Later in life, David fell into sin, and his prideful attitude of ownership reached a deplorable depth of having a man killed to cover his sin and take this man's wife. And David was led to repentance with the, through the prophet Nathan, but his consequences followed him throughout his life. And many would say that David, during this time, should have been with, out to battle with his army, and instead he was taking a break. He had extra time. He had leisure time. Now, in this day and age, we have lots of extra time and lots of extra money. I know it doesn't feel like some of you have a lot of extra money. Well, let me just remind you that if you make $35,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of the world in income. The average American makes $45,000 a year. If you lived in Liberia, that average would drop to $781. So don't complain to me that you don't have enough of income, that you're not wealthy. I think all of us have room for humility in managing the master's wealth. How are we spending our extra, our extra time, our extra money, and our extra resources? Have you remained humble enough to trust the master? Or have you demanded the illusion of ownership? And I'm sort of missing my PowerPoint um, at this time. If you can can picture a a stream of income, which looks like a stream, and there's a certain amount of that stream of income that you need to survive on. And so we build up a little dam to stop some of that flow And that stream of income should be flowing towards kingdom use, towards people in need, um, towards the master's kingdom needs, not our own needs. But we build up a little dam to stop some of the master's wealth. 
to cover our needs. But what happens when we have lots of income, uh, but we don't need to survive? Rather than letting that stream of income from the master flow to the need, often we just build a bigger dam. And we continue to build the dam and hoard that stream of income for ourselves rather than allowing it to flow to the need that it was intended for. Are we humble enough to trust the master or have we demanded to use his wealth? The fifth attitude of a faithful steward is compassion. We all know the story of the Good Samaritan and how he had compassion. Well, maybe, I think if we view ourselves as owner of this stream of income, we'll respond like the priest and the Levite who walked on the other side of the road. They ignored it. They were callous to it. They lacked compassion to respond to the need. And over time, we build up calluses and we become careless, and we begin to justify our lack of compassion. But if you are a steward, you understand the resources are not yours anyway, and so you're free to give them and allow them to flow to the need out of your heart of compassion. Now, uh, when we have very little extra income, it's easy to be compassionate because we can't afford to give. And so we say we're compassionate, and we would give if we could, but we can't. It's also easier to make decisions on wealth if you don't have it. If you have no money to spend, you can just simply say you can't afford it. You can't afford a new car. You can't afford to give to missions. And so when our income increases and we have some wealth there, that's when life becomes a little more difficult and those decisions are no longer based on whether or not we have or can afford to give or purchase an item. And I want to challenge, I think those of us who have little are critical towards those who have a lot. But maybe we're the ones that are making all of our decisions based on our money. And maybe money has become a god to us. We don't even know how to decide because we've just been following our money. Are you basing all your decisions on whether or not you can afford it? Or whether or not you can afford to give? Or well, maybe money has become a god. Who's making the decisions in your life? When I was dating... Um, we went on a walk one evening and I had some quarters in my pocket and my wife hates when I tell this story but I rolled them down the road it was full moon and um, the light would shine on them and I would try to see how far they would go and um, we, we sort of had a fight about that uh, later on um, now it wasn't that that she thought that I needed those quarters to survive um, she knew full well that I would be just fine without four quarters. But it was the carelessness that was represented in rolling those quarters down the road that she was concerned about. And I think that without even knowing it, she knew that there's a connection between how we spend our money and our overall attitude in life. Somebody who's careless with their money is often careless in other areas of their lives. And she probably felt that Maybe I was going to be careless with her. I wasn't going to treat her properly or value her because I wasn't valuing what the master had given me. In our lives, it's very easy to become careless. And we can observe the lives of those around us and see that carelessness in finance is often just um, a manifestation of a careless attitude. Jesus was compassionate. He gave comfort. He gave hope to those in bondage. He assisted the poor and he reached the lost. And we need to use his resources to do the same. Money can certainly have a corrupting effect on us. 
and we need to be held accountable with our wealth and our finances. And this is difficult because we've all been given different talents and it creates tension. And there's tension from without. There's advertisements constantly bombarding us to be discontent with what we have. I read somewhere that the average American sees 5,000 advertisements a day. Now, I doubt a lot of those are on television, and we think we're uh, free from that. But think about how many advertisements you see in each day. If you walk down the aisle at Walmart, um, there's advertisements everywhere. And so there's pressure from without. What about pressures from within? How is our culture doing with creating pressure to accumulate stuff? I found it fascinating. Several weeks ago, uh, we had a meeting at Anabaptist Financial, and I used the phrase, uh, all the bigwigs were there. But I was getting to know some of them, and so when I would walk up to them, I would say, um, my name is Glenn, how are you? And then I'd say, what do you do for a living? And they'd often ask me the same thing, except they knew I worked for Anabaptist Financial. But usually when we get to know somebody, especially us men, maybe, in our culture, we say, what do you do for a living? And we make judgments and base a lot of that person's reputation on his answer. Does he own a business? Has he accumulated some things? And we judge him and make uh, assumptions based on his response. Another thing that our culture maybe doesn't do so well in is um, in this idea of, of ownership is we uh, assume that somebody who rents a house is not doing well and they're a poor steward. And we create some pressure on young folks to assume debt that they should not be in. We've sort of, uh, yeah, we've created this mentality that you need to own your home or you're not a good steward. And especially when we're younger, this can be dangerous. I know that finances is a touchy issue, uh, but we need to talk about them. Uh, it's sort of sometimes the elephant in the room that never gets mentioned. Some of you brought money with you today. So even on a Sunday, you don't get a break from it. You decide what to bring for the offering. We deal with this all the time, every day, many times each day. So let's be willing to ask tough questions and to have discussions and to learn from each other. We have all been given talents by the master. Are we being faithful with what belongs to our master? We must learn to hold our possessions with an open hand, realizing that all things belong to God. Now, part of my fear in presenting a sermon like this is that the waters would just be more muddy than they were when you got here. How do we handle wealth? How do we live eternally on this earth? We're created to be eternal beings. We're here as pilgrims through, going through the earth. We're, we're commanded to be in the world, but not of the world. And sometimes that's not always a real simple process. So I'd like to just simplify this in a few sentences, and maybe if you haven't paid attention at all up until this point, you can get the whole sermon in one sentence. And that's this. We work with the resources God has given you to provide for your needs and spread the good news of the gospel into all the world. In Genesis 2.15, after God created the world and everything in it, it says that the Lord took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. One of man's earliest responsibilities was to work with the resources created by God. In Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So I believe there's two directives to manage the resources of the master and to lead all men to the gospel is what we should use our resources for. Again, the message in one sentence. Work with the resources God has given you to provide for your needs and spread the, gospel, spread the good news of the gospel 
into all the world. Be content with what you have, for I have said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's kneel together for prayer. Father in heaven, we recognize that simply based on where you have chosen to have us live, that we are blessed and we are above average in the number of talents that we have received. The resources that we have at our disposal is phenomenal, and we want to bless you and thank you for that. And we recognize that it's a big responsibility, and we, have, we are responsible to you ultimately for how we deal with uh, the wealth that you have given us. We want to be faithful, and I pray that you would help us to develop patterns and habits in our lives and in our culture that would bless your kingdom and could be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.